feel the anointing in the house tonight. Amen. Yes. Praise God. It's wonderful to feel the presence of the Lord. That was a wonderful worship tonight. It took me back almost 10 years. It was 10 years in April. And uh, when we began Harvest Fellowship, um, we had no musicians. And so we got a bunch of CDs together. And Dennis came along and led this type of worship for us. And I'm going to tell you, it took a little while to get used to singing the CDs. But we saw some tremendous moves of God uh, that are, are really second to none. They were as good as any revival spirit that I've ever seen in my life. We saw the Lord come down at one point in time when He just, like a lightning bolt, crashed right between me and Pastor Steve. And I felt this way, and Steve felt that way. It was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. And uh, so, thank you, Dennis and the worship team. Uh, it, was, it was put together pretty quickly. Uh, Katie uh, texted me this morning, just really sorry that she couldn't be here, but she is really struggling with this flu. She sounded really bad, and so she was so, so sorry that she couldn't be here tonight, but uh, we do miss her, and we need to continue to pray for her, but um, wow, that, that was great. Yes. And so tonight, uh, we want to continue with the theme of what we've been talking about for the last several weeks when I've had the opportunity. I, of course, wasn't here last week. I had a little touch of that myself. And so uh, you guys had the service here and Larry did his little bit of message. I was so sorry. I couldn't be there for that. I heard the great reports and uh, still people have been affected by that. And then last Wednesday, we got a letter from me. Thank God. But uh, I've been teaching for a few weeks, maybe a couple of months now, the thought of atmospheres and climates. And um, the idea and what we're trying to convey to each and every one of us is the fact that there needs to be, uh, there needs to be a, uh, a realization and a, uh, a mindset for each and every one of us of the fact that we do have spiritual uh, atmospheres around us, that there is spiritual entities that are always around us, always around us. And that there are different atmospheres and climates that we find ourselves in uh, at, from time to time. <coughs> in church life, when we come into the house of God and begin to worship the Lord and worship Him, the Bible says to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And as we worship the Lord, we begin to set an atmosphere for the Spirit of God to dwell in. Yes. He said, I will dwell among the praises of my people. Yes, right. And so we come into the house of God together and we come into unity of one mind and one accord to just focus on Jesus and start worshiping Him because of who He is. And as we begin to sing these songs to the Lord, the Lord is pleased with that sweet smelling savor, is what He calls it, of praise. And He comes down and reciprocates that and comes and dwells among us. We understand that when we receive Jesus Christ, He comes into our heart and He lives in our hearts by faith. And then the second work of grace, we get baptized in the Holy Spirit with the evidence, the initial physical evidence of speaking in tongues. And so when we come together, we bring Him with us. But as you read through the book of Acts, you find out in Acts chapter 2 that there's two different feelings there at the, at the very first baptism. It says that, and the Spirit of God filled all the house in where they were sitting. And then they were filled with the Holy Spirit. And began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. And so when we come into the house of God, that's something that we want to relate to and remember. And, and that's the desire of Harvest Fellowship when we worship God. We know that you love the Lord. We know that you bring Jesus with you. But we want you to just join together with us with the mindset that I have come into the house to praise the Lord. And start praising Him in spirit and truth so that that habitation, that fit habitation that is called for the Spirit of God to come and not only be in us, but start walking among us. And we start feeling the dwelling place of the Lord as He comes and walks the aisles. And we get that presence that is just an overarching uh, presence and sensation that we get what we call those goosebumps or cold chills or whatever we want to identify those with. That's our desire is to get into that spot and where we feel the presence of God in the overflow. Yes. And so that is the Holy Spirit's uh, response to the people of God that are worshiping Him in spirit and truth. He comes and that presence can be felt by same person and sinner alike. I know this because it happened to me. Before I was ever saved, I went to a church, I visited a church. I'm not saying that God was blessing my actions. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that. But he was buried with us and he's real. 
He was bearing witness that he is alive and well. And I went into that place and it felt really good. That what I felt I didn't understand. I didn't know what it was. But it was certainly the presence of the Holy Spirit bearing witness of his reality. And so that's something we desire and strive for all the time. And, and of all the spirits that, that we contend with in this life, uh, the Holy Ghost is more powerful than them all. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so he, God is a spirit. And, and as we worship him, we worship him in spirit and truth. And the Holy Spirit is a spirit. He is a person. He is the third person of the Godhead. And he is the strongest influence in the earth today. He is the strongest influence in the earth today. He he is stronger than any other spirit because the Holy Spirit is God. Amen. So He is Creator. He He was with He was with the Godhead in the original creation. God said, "Let us make man in our image." Well, before that, excuse me. When you go back, it says that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. It says, "And the Spirit of God brooded upon the waters." And so he was there in the original creation. We need to know this and recognize this because, listen to me, what I want us to try to uh, capture here tonight is this sense that we are, we are always in a position of having a spiritual influence around us. And as Christians, we have the choice to make. We have to make a choice who, are, who we're going to attach our allegiance to. Because... God wants us to attach our allegiance to the Holy Spirit so that He can lead us in the Spirit. We can be filled with the Spirit and we can do exploits because of the Spirit of God. Amen? Amen. But there are also opposing spirits. You know, that's something that occurred in, in March. He's going to be dealing with on Tuesday. He's going to be dealing with the armor of God. You're going to read in Ephesians chapter 6 that whole uh, idea of putting on the whole armor of God is because it's for warfare. Right? Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. It says in Ephesians 6.10, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so we see a, a degree of different levels of, of spiritual activity that is a, wants to oppose the people of God. And not only that, they want to hold unsaved people captive and blinded by them, uh, from the truth. That Jesus wants to love them, save them, and deliver them from their darkness. And so we need to be aware of that. I want, I want us to be able to accomplish the point of that. But we have a keen awareness that every day we have a choice to make. Spirits always want to have a full expression of themselves. Jesus talked about a man being delivered, being a, a, a demon, being exercised, being cast out of a man. He says, when a spirit, when spirits are cast out of a person, they go through dry places. And, and, and the temple that they dwelt in is swept and clean. And it says that if that person isn't on guard, they don't fill that place up, that void, with Jesus. They don't fill that place up and protect themselves against an invasion of them coming back. They will come back. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus taught this himself. He said they will come back. And they'll find that house swept and clean. And they'll invade again. And the condition of the person is worse than it was before. And so the point I want to make here is that Scripture all through the Bible teaches us this truth. Is that there are spiritual entities all around us. It's nothing to fear. Although Hollywood and the world don't know what they're messing with. But they are playing with some areas in their life that they're going to cause them a whole lot of trouble. A movie coming out soon, I don't know if it's already come out, about the Ouija board. And all kinds of crazy stuff going on in that thing. And these kids are going to watch that stuff. That's just an open door. You know, when you when you when you, we consider what I'm trying to get you to understand is they're all always around. You know, demonic influence will even come into your church. They're not afraid to worship. No, they're not afraid of our worship. They're afraid of God. But they're not afraid of our worship. I mean, Satan, you probably, most of you, if not all of you already know this, Satan, his position in heaven before he got kicked out, he was the lead worshiper in heaven. He was, he was, he was Lucifer, the anointed cherub. He led the worship. So he knows how to worship God, and, and he likes worship. But he doesn't like, as a matter of fact, he loves worship. He just doesn't want you to worship God. He wants you to worship him. See? And so, um, so, so, 
demonic influence can invade our church. Amen. And I'm not saying you guys have come in with devils. So don't go and say, Pastor Paul does a bunch of demons tonight. That's not, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, what I'm saying is God wants us to put on the mind of Christ and be aware of spiritual activity all the time. Every single day, there is spiritual activity that wants to have full expression. The fullest expression of a spirit can only be realized if they have a voice to speak through. That's when they get full expression. Now they can have oppressive, um, they can have oppressive um, influence to where you just feel real heavy and you feel bad and you feel and you feel like something is just um, real gory, gory, wrong, you know, something not right. We we know this. We know this in a very practical level. When you know, I've said this before, but. Some of you haven't heard this. We know it's on a real practical level. We can feel the spirits. You know, you, you, you surprise somebody and come over their house and, and husband and wife just got into a big fight. I mean, they're, they're going at it. And then all of a sudden the pastor shows up and they go, oh, the pastor's here. And you walk into that environment, into that atmosphere. And they're acting like everything else is okay. But you feel it. You feel something and the atmosphere isn't quite right. Because there's a lingering impact there. Well, that is that is where uh, there's a recognition, and it goes beyond that as a Christian, where we can actually begin to take on the gifting that comes with the Holy Spirit of being able to discern the spirits. Yes. You know, in John, I want to go to if your Bibles. We'll go get into some scripture, but I want to go to Matthew. Is going to be our text tonight, Matthew chapter 11. This is just all kind of a little bit of uh, review, but. Um, uh, John, in John's gospel, his, uh, John's letter, his first letter, chapter 4, he tells us in verse 1 to try the spirits to see whether they be of God. And that really means is that we are to be able to recognize what we're dealing with here, what type of spirit that person is carrying. And we can know that, you know. Uh, you can know when you're welcome and when you're not welcome. There's a spirit about that, right? And so we try the spirits. We know when someone is... Uh, when you when you really are exercised in the gifting of the discernment of spirits, you can tell when somebody is heaven is heavily uh, depressed or oppressed. You can feel that spirit on them. How many knows what I'm talking about here tonight? And so this is a gift that comes from the Holy Spirit, and, and we recognize those things not to go, oh man, that person you know is really has a spirit of depression on them. We're to if God will help us and they will let us. We are to intercede for them, pray for them, and help to get that thing off of them, or possibly out of them. I've dealt with a couple of issues uh, as a pastor where I have seen some things that you would not believe, but I saw them with my own eyes, and so did others that are in this room. I saw a man one time right here in this church uh, about uh, right where the big city did it, uh, where the guy actually got in a tripod position, his face elongated, he turned green, his eyes bulged, he jumped around here like a frog. He looked like a frog. And God is my witness, I'm telling you the truth. He had seven demons in it, and it was wild stuff, and it was real. And so demon possession isn't just a story of the Bible, it is real. The good news is, is that we have the power of God in us, the power of the Holy Spirit, to deal with that. Jesus gave commission to us as believers, he said, Behold, I give you power over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. You shall heal the sick, you shall speak with no tongues, and you shall cast out devils. Now, now, I say that with some pre-qualifications. Okay, you might be saved, and you might be going to church, but you may not be ready to deal with a demon. If that is more mature, prayed up, Holy Ghost filled people. This same person... When he first came to our church, I was made aware. There's going to be a guy come to your church. Pastor, have you ever seen a demon? Yes, I have. Okay, well, I've got a, I've got a, I've got a, um, a brother in law that's going to come to church, and, and he's got a demon. I said, okay, we'll be ready for him. And so um, he came, and I was preaching right in this church, and he was on the back of you there. And I said, the blood of Jesus can wash your sins away. And when I said that, I heard this. And he ran out that door. <laughs> and in a couple minutes he came back he came back in and 
then I, I preached on a, on a long, and I said, uh, I said, Jesus rose up from the dead on the third day and was victorious over the cross. And he went, and ran out the door. This happened three times. Certainly got my attention and everybody else's as well. We had two or three of the deacons go out there. The ushers went out there to check on him. The, the last guy, you remember Brother Robinson? You know, Brother Robinson, he went out there. The, the guy was squatting down in the parking lot, right at the end of the building here. He turned around and gave one of those demon stairs, you know, kind of like, you know, with wide eyes. And, and Brother Robinson looked like, oh, you got the demon. He turned around and came back in the church. <laughs> and so the uh, church was over, and I, I, I went outside the church, and right on the side of the door here, I looked over to the corner where this tree is at, and there was this man, and he was hiding behind a tree. And he peeked out around like that, and he saw me, and I was like, this great big smile on his face. And he just got, got out, and came walking right over to me. And he came over there, and he shook my hand, and didn't know English very well. And I, I introduced myself, I said, I knew you would be here, I'm glad you came. He said, I don't understand. I said, I knew you were coming today. He said, I don't understand. I said, you have a problem. He said, I don't understand. I said, you have a demon. And when I said, you have a demon, I'm going to tell you, he growled like a tiger. Not like, Rrr. it was like, you know, a, a real tiger. It came from deep down in here. It was like, a, it's so animalistic, it shocked me. I mean, I can't do it justice the way it sounded. And I said, I'm going to pray for you. And he growled like that. I said, but not right now. <laughs> I, said, I said, you come back Wednesday. I was smart enough to know that I needed to do some prayer and fasting. I mean, I need to do some prayer and fasting, so I did. And we did some prayer and fasting. I called up Larry, a couple other people, and we spent hours here dead with Larry, praying for him. And boy, there's some wild stuff going on, and it was, uh, I just don't want to get into the gory details, but it got really, really messy. But he's delivered, set free in his right mind, and business owner, and doing well today. So we praise God for that. I said all that because uh, spiritual awareness it's something that we all need to be aware of. There are things that will affect our lives as Christians that are not good. That's why the Bible is kind of like, a, it's, it's almost like a, a, a road map. It's kind of like a GPS system. It, it gives us standards and conduct and rules and, and insights into how we need to live our lives so that we're living a life that can keep us in right standing with God and protected from the onslaughts of the enemy. And there's many different doorways that open up that may not necessarily possess you. Because I don't believe a Christian can be possessed. Once you're saved, blood lost, you're protected by that bloodline. You cannot be possessed as a Christian. But I would caution and say, watch your lifestyle. Because I don't believe once saved, always saved. I believe you will be, you will be saved in the end if you continue to persevere. If you continue to go forward, if you continue to grow. You will make mistakes. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about living an outlandish life where you start doing Ouija boards, watching all of these crazy, scary movies, listening to rock and roll music, drinking and smoking and taking dope and all that kind of stuff. You're doing that kind of stuff, you're not saved. Period. I don't care if you go to church. You're not saved. Pastor, how can you be so mean? It says it in the Bible. It's not me. It's the Word of God. And so, so, but if you're here and you're trying to do good, and, and but you're still, you know, not perfect and you make mistakes, I'm not saying that you're not saved. I'm not saying you make one little mistake here and all of a sudden God writes you off the list. No, no, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about we have a rule here. We have a book that shows us how to walk that life, how to live that life, and we do our best to live it. And none of us are perfect, but we strive to be perfect. And when we mess up, when we mess up, we say, God, I didn't want to do that. Please forgive me. And we have an advocate with the Father. And we confess our sins and His blood is He's just and His blood cleanses us and picks us back up and we keep walking. So we're trying to do our best. We're not trying to do our worst and say, God, God knows my heart. His grace has me covered. You're in a dangerous place right now. But, but then there's another issue that's serious, not quite as serious as that, but is serious. And that is, what are we allowing, what doorways are we allowing to open in our life? that creates an opportunity for the enemy to come in. And so there's many of those. And spiritual entities are always around us. They're always around us. And they'll whisper in your ear and they'll say, Don't listen to him. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Yeah, they, they will. 
speak right into your ear and tell you. You ever see that cartoon? You got the angel on one side, the devil on one side. <laughs> it could be like that, you know. Kind of, it'll look like that. Demons are pretty ugly. But uh, how do how do I know this? I don't know. I just know this. Yeah. <laughs> and then, the, um, but they whisper in your ear and tell you don't pay attention to it. Don't listen to what he doesn't know what he's talking about. I'm telling you that that everything, every spirit has to have a doorway. They have a path. They have to have a passageway. That's what you call it, a porthole. Some invitation of entrance to come in, not not maybe to possess you, but absolutely to oppress you and harass you. And so we need to be aware of, of all of that. Now, now that all being said, that really isn't what I've come to talk about tonight. Because greater is he that is in us yeah. than he that is in the world. Yeah. God has given us the power over all the power of the enemy. And so I want to encourage you tonight that you have what it takes to cause the devil to run away. Yeah. And the Bible tells us that if we draw near to God, then God will draw near to us, and we can resist the devil, and he will flee from us. You know, Peter talks, talks about the devil. He says, your adversary, the devil, goes about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. It doesn't say he is a roaring lion. It says he goes about as a roaring lion. The truth of the matter is he is not a roaring lion. He is a big chicken. Well, don't say that about the devil. He'll jump on you. Bring it on. I'm not afraid of it. Amen. I'm not afraid. Don't do that. Don't say that. He's going to get... You know, I've heard people say, oh, don't challenge the devil. God's word tells us we're not to have any fear. I want to say this and we'll move on to the good stuff here. The, the, the only thing that the devil, his only advantage, his only advantage point against a spirit-filled, blood-bought Christian is the ability to get us to have fear. If he can get us to have fear... It will cripple our faith, and he can really mess with you. He can really mess up your mind. He can, he can really do some physical things to your body. He can, you know, he, he can do some harm to you if you have fear. And so what they will do, uh, if you see the manifestation of one, they'll go, rah! They absolutely will. Rah! And it's a pretty scary thing, because it's worse than what I just did. I mean, it's like, oh. Pastor, you didn't scare me a bit. No, but if a demon does that, I guarantee you, uh, the, the spirit of fear will be there to see if it can have a foothold in your soul. If it can, if it can get you to just shriek a little bit. You know, get, and so on. Um, when that man came into the church, I met him right here. He had seven demons. He came around the corner and said, I prayed and fasted for three days. I was ready for him. I was teaching the spiritual warfare class. I said, this guy's coming. When he gets, I said, he, he's supposed to come. And at 8 o'clock, he had a class at the, at the college. He's supposed to come. And so, uh, when he comes, if you're going to stay here, I want you to bow your heads and pray. I've got people selected that can help me pray. You just bow your heads and pray. If you don't want to stay, leave since he comes. 8 o'clock sharp, he came in through the door with his wife. I said, well, they're here now, so why don't you come on up here? Well, half the church emptied out, and I thank God that they did. You know, they got up and left, and some stayed. And he came around the side here, and when he got here, he, his head pulled back, and he started laughing, and he said, ah, ha, 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 we are seven! We are seven! And when he said that, it was like, oh my God, for a second. It was like that fear tried to hit me, because it was trying to get you to be have fear. It was like this, and then immediately, the Spirit of God goes, I rebuke you! Immediately. Fear didn't get on me. It presented itself, and then it was just like, and then immediately, I rebuke you. And I didn't even lay my hand on him. He went down on the ground. And then, then the fight was on. And that lasted for several hours. I think we got out of here three o'clock in the morning, something like that. Larry was with me that night. And this, this took several different sessions to get him finally delivered. But, um, but fear is the only, is the only weapon that that Satan has to try to get you to shriek back, to try to get you to back up. And if he can get you to, to agree with the fear, he's got you. And so we need to know God's word, what it says, that we need to be experienced with God's word. And so and if we're going to take on something like that. 
But anyway, um, uh, when you rise up in faith, you draw near to God, He draws near to you, you resist the devil, then He flees. Because He knows He's whipped. He knows He can't do anything. So, uh, all of that said, uh, Spirit, their greatest desires have full expression, and the only way that they can have full expression is if you give them a voice. So they need they need someone to attach agreement with them, and they need uh, there's different levels. You know, there's principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness. There's different levels and degrees of spirits, and uh, and we need to recognize those things. We need to discern the spirits. What spirit we're up? Even even Jesus, as the disciples were walking into uh, one of the cities, and they refused to let Jesus come into the city. You know, uh, James and John got real indignant by that. They were really upset. They got offended that they, that that city didn't want anything to do with the master. And they said, "Lord, do you want us to call fire down on them?" And the Lord looked back at them and said, "You don't know what spirit you were of. It was the wrong spirit." So we can, we can attach our agreement to the wrong spirit. And sometimes we do that. And so sometimes we will attach our, our agreement. And I'm talking about oppressions and, and spiritual influence that are out here now. Not in here as Christians, but out here. And we'll attach our spiritual agreement to, or we'll attach our agreement to a spiritual influence that is not a godly influence. Uh, it could be rage or, or it could be anger or it could be, you know, uh, swearing. It could be by the way, if you don't know, uh, when you are saved, God starts working on your language. Yes. He starts working. He starts working on you know the right way to say things. And, and, and if if you have a prolific problem with swearing, you need to pray about that. Yeah. Amen. You need, you need to ask God to help you clean that up. It shouldn't be coming bitter, and sweet water should not flow out of the same fountain. And there's a spirit behind that. You know, those words have attachments to them. And so all of that is out here, and, and it causes it causes a weight on our life. But God is greater, and, and He has a plan. And His plan was to raise up a Holy Spirit filled church that would uh, that would possess the Spirit of God in them. That was the great promise that Jesus made. He told it in, in um, Saint John fourteen. He said, "It's really a blessing for you." This is kind of my Old terminology, I'm just going to break it down here a little bit. It's really a blessing for you that I'm going to go away. It's really beneficial to you that I'm leaving because when I go away, I'm going to send you another comforter. That's going to be just like me. He's going to be God, but he's going to be the Spirit of God. He's going to be uh, the Holy Spirit. And when he comes, he will be with you and he's going to be in you. And so we become the habitation of the Holy Spirit. So God dwells in us. By the power of the Holy Spirit. And so we've got the greatest spiritual power that this world knows. Amen. And God invested that. He imparted that. He deposited that in our lives for the purpose of going and doing great exploits in this earth until Jesus comes again. That's why he, that's why he gave us that second experience in life. If you have not been filled with the Holy Spirit, with the evidence of that, the baptized uh, with the evidence of being uh, speaking in tongues, you need to be seeking that, diligently seeking for the Holy Spirit. Men cannot give the Holy Spirit to you. It's a gift from God. Amen. 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 But truly seek the Holy Spirit and ask, ask God to pour the Holy Spirit into your life and let Him fill you up to the brim and overflowing with the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And you will know you no one will tell you, have to tell you, you will know when you've been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Un undeniable uh, experience that goes beyond that of being saved. Being saved is great, and it's the most important thing in our lives. How many would agree with that? Yeah. Being saved is the most important thing in our lives, but there is a second work of grace, being baptized in the Holy Spirit, that is real and is available as believers seek for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. There's some believers in the book of Acts, uh, somewhere around chapter 19, the, uh, the Apostle Paul runs into these guys and says, uh, have you received the Holy Spirit since you believed? And they said, we haven't even heard 
If there be such a thing as the Holy Spirit. He said, then what baptism were you baptized with? And they said, unto John's baptism. And he started preaching to them Jesus. And then he, baptized, and then he laid his hands on them and they all received the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues. The Holy Spirit contends with these other spiritual entities. And through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the power to have dominion over them. Yes. We are more than conquerors. Yes. We drive out every evil influence. So it becomes um, in, important and um, very, it becomes the most important thing for us then, as we are saved and filled with the Holy Spirit, to be able to discern the spirits that are contending and striving against our own personal life. There's, there's a lot, there's a list. And there's probably some that aren't are unlisted. And but you need to be aware of them. And you need to know when they are when you're entertaining them. So there's a spirit, you know, the spirit of greed, and the spirit of lust, and the spirit of the spirit of pornography, and the spirit of drunkenness, and the spirit of partying. There's all these different spirits. They go on and on and on. Because there's a legion of them. You know, of uh, the you guys remember the story when Jesus comes in the boat into the land of the Gadarenes and there's like this wild man. He just all over the place. They couldn't hold him down with chains and he's just shrieking and just making a hack of the whole place. People are scared to death. And Jesus steps on the shore and, and this legion comes running out to him and trying to scare him away. And Jesus starts contending with him and casts the devil out. starts talking to him before he You know, he starts talking to him. He says, what is your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. And, and the de demons make a request to be cast into a herd of pigs. And the, the Lord gives them his request to go. And they go to this herd of pigs and fly off of the cliff and drown in the sea. And so, um, and so there's, there's multitudes of different demons. And I don't want you to go to bed dreaming about demons tonight. Okay? I don't want you to have freaked out dreams and worry, you know, that that... That shirt hanging in the closet is really a ghost, or, you know. You know. Uh, that's not my intention to get you guys freaked out. I want you guys to know who you are in Jesus Christ. I want you to understand the authority that God has placed in your life as a believer. And we need to learn to walk in that authority. We need to learn to take the power of God in the presence of His Holy Spirit and do the things that the Lord has commissioned for us to do. There's a plan that God has made for the church, and that plan was to let our light shine, to be salt and light in the earth, and make a difference. And so the expression of the Holy Spirit wants to speak out of our mouths and declare the good things of God, declare that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and begin to intrude upon the culture of our region with the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and make a difference. That's what salt and light does. Salt and light makes a difference. So, very quickly, I know I've rambled a lot. Let's look at Matthew chapter 11. And uh, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, Matthew chapter 11. And uh, the first part of this chapter is, is uh, John's in prison and, and he's questioning where he's at, why he's there. Did he make a mistake? Is Jesus indeed the Christ? And he sends some of his disciples to go and ask Jesus, are you really the one? And, uh, and that, that's a good learning lesson there. And that is, you know, in, in times of discouragement, we can't get this one. It's, it's natural. John was a mighty man of God. But that's not where I want to go. I want to go uh, to verse, verse 9. We'll start there. Matthew 11, 9 says, But what would you have to see a prophet? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before thy face, which shall prepare thy way before thee. We're talking about John and his ministry in the desert. Verse 11. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding. He that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now think about that for a minute. Go on very quickly. So Jesus is giving John the Baptist his promise. He's saying, of all of the men 
anybody that's ever been born in the natural way of a woman, of all the prophets that have ever been born, you're talking about Elijah, Elisha, Jeremiah, Daniel, you know, Malachi, Zechariah, the list goes on and on, and all these great and mighty prophets of God. Jesus said, of all those that were ever born of a woman, John was greater than any of them. That's what it says. He says, For verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there have not risen a greater than John the Baptist. Notwithstanding, he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, so now he's, he's talking about those that have been born into the kingdom. Who are those that are born into the kingdom of God? It's us. Thank you. It's us. It's us. We, Jesus came declaring the kingdom. John the Baptist came declaring the kingdom. They preached the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom wasn't instituted until Jesus finished the work on the cross and got up on the third day. The kingdom was now offered to whosoever will. You're born again. Your name's written down. You're now part of the kingdom of God. Amen. And he that is the least in the kingdom is greater than John the Baptist. But John the Baptist was greater than all the other prophets. How can that be? Because it's not a matter of words, it's a matter of position, it's a matter of privilege. See, all the prophets before John the Baptist spoke about there is coming a Messiah. John the Baptist said, there is the Messiah. There's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. All the way up to the cross. The church, those that are the least in the kingdom of heaven, we have the privilege of saying he went to the cross but he didn't stay in the on the cross. He got up on the third day and now he, there's everlasting life for whosoever will believe in him will not perish but have everlasting life. And the offer of eternity that we possess as believers is a greater work than that of John the Baptist saying he can save you from your sins. That's a wonderful thing. We need to be saved from our sins. But he didn't have the message of the fact that he's also going to open up hell's gates and allow people that have been held down through these centuries of time, through these millennia of times, and now have a way to live eternally in the presence of God. And so because of position, we have a greater place. Now, let me just conclude here. Verse 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. That was a real popular scripture about 15 years ago. Everybody was preaching this verse of scripture about 15 years ago. And it still has a lot of impact. Probably more so now than it did then. But it's funny how revelation occurs to us. And how the Holy Ghost does things. And it seems like, you know, a lot of times uh, you'll be impressed to preach something. And be led to study something. And, and you teach that. And all of a sudden, you heard that that pastor over there taught that. And that person on TV over there taught that. And it, it's almost, you see how the Spirit of God is working. He's bringing a message across. But this was a very popular verse of scripture that a lot of people were teaching about, uh, probably about 15 years ago now, I'm just guessing. But it's still very applicable today. The days uh, of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it, take it by force. What I wanted to show you in this is that uh, there is a, there is a, a clashing of cultures. There is a um, there is a culture and there is a counterculture. There is light, there is darkness, there is the saved and the unsaved. And what he's showing us here is that there are, this is the time for us to recognize who we are, recognize with what we're contending with, and do our best to make a difference. We need to do our best to make a difference in our county, to all the county. Amen. God deposited the Holy Spirit in our life, gave us anointing to tear down strongholds, to cast down imaginations and thoughts and every high thing, and make a difference in our county. And so what I have come to teach you tonight is that we are, we are in a fight. We are, we are contending for the souls of men and women and children. Amen. And God has deposited that power in you to make a difference. This verse of scripture that says, uh, from the John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence and the violent take it by force. God is not in the violence. If you go back to the book of, of Genesis, that was the reason he brought in the flood. He said men's hearts were continually evil. They did whatever was right in their own eyes and violence filled the earth. 
So it's not the type of violence that we would equate. But really, the word there in the Greek is beatitude. It's kind of a strange word, beatitude. And it really means to press into something. It means to make room. Make room to get in there and make yourself some room into the culture. Part of the things that we're contending with and the problems that we've had over the past few decades, and, and it's gotten probably worse than we've ever known it, you know, with all of the things that have been passed, you know, all of the uh, rights that have raised up and all of the social issues and problems that we've had, probably a big part of that has happened because the church would not open the mouth and let their voice be heard. We didn't get the Holy Ghost opportunity to speak. But it's not too late. Um, Jesus will come again. And it's not too late. And it, and it is important for us to grab a hold of this and know that there will be those. You'll recognize their spirit. You'll know that they're not ready or willing to hear what you have to say. And God doesn't call you to invade their space and, and jump on them and beat them up. But what he's calling you to do is to recognize that you have a commission. You have a call. You have a purpose. God has a plan. He wants as many to be saved as he as can be, and he is counting on each and every one of us to do our part. Amen. And so, well, how do we do that? Every single day, discern the opportunity for an open door, for an opportunity to find that spot, to push into that spot, and say something for the Lord, invite them to know Jesus, or tell them to come to church, bring a conversation, say a word of something that may open the door for you to be able to let God use you to, see, to speak to somebody's soul. That's what he's talking about here. He's talking about um, um, invading the territory that God has given us and pushing into that and making influence. I want to go down to the banner closing. I promise you this will be the last couple of verses. Uh, verse 16. We're, we're going to look at this verse and verse 17. And then I'm going to make one last thought, and then we're going to close. Jesus says this in the conclusion of his teaching. He says, But whereunto shall I liken this generation? It is like unto children sitting in the markets, and calling unto their fellows, and saying, We have piped in you, and you have not danced. We have born unto you, and you have not lamented. The discernment of, of recognizing the spiritual entities that are around us is important. Um, have you ever questioned what is the spiritual principality over Tuolumne County? What is the spiritual influence over Sonora? What is the spiritual influence over Sedona, Arizona? We can we can feel that. Many of you re recognize this. You'll drive into a, a, an area it's like something shifted and changed. There was a dominating culture and spirit that hung over that place. This is true and this is real. And and uh, and we, but in these verses of the scripture, what did he say here? Let's look at sixteen again. But we're too sure. I like in this generation. It's like to, it's like to children sitting in the marketplace. In other words, it's like kids at Colts. You know, you got your little grandkids. You know, you know those kids do when you go shopping. They're running in between those little, you know, the clothes are hiding like over here and over there, and they're just having a blast. They're having a blast and just having fun, running here and there, and they have no idea that there is a spirit of exchange taking place up here. People are picking stuff up, they're going and buying things that they want to buy. They, they're, they are just oblivious to truly what, what they're there for, why, why they're there. And Jesus is comparing that type of activity to us. To us. Is that we'll hear this teaching. And we'll forget what was said. And we won't ask God to give me a greater discernment. If there is a gift that we need to rise up in the body of Christ today more than ever before, it is the gift of discerning the Spirit. Amen. 1 Corinthians 12 10 says that God will give us the gift of the discerning of spirits. We need to discern what we're continuing with, what's around us, because we can make a difference. We can. Make a difference. And so he closes it out and says, He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit sends unto the church. And so um, um, it takes work, it takes conscious 
and intentional effort to remind ourselves that there's spiritual activity around me all the time. Of, okay, what am I doing in my house now? What am I allowing my soul to be? What am I feeding my soul and allowing my mind to be entertained with? I'm not going to preach or teach my convictions on you tonight. I'm just talking about discerning the type of spirits that we entertain. Because I will say this, it affects your spirit. Whatever it is, it will affect your spirit. Any questions or comments before we close tonight? I know this has gone a little bit long, but it's been a great night. I've enjoyed the worship. I've enjoyed the word. I've enjoyed being here with you. You guys have any questions about anything that's been discussed tonight? Okay. Ready to go out there and uh, just be influential in our community. Are you ready to let God use you and push into you somewhere and make a difference in somebody's life? How many will make a difference in somebody's life? Try your best. Amen. All right. Father, we thank you tonight, Lord, for your word. Lord, it is quick and powerful. Sharper than any two inches Lord. Not does the body that joins us more. We thank you for the word of God. Lord God, that is a light to our path. And I'm a tour of We thank you, God, for your people. Bless them.